following program in the series, Common Sense Christianity, The Secret Power of Values, was produced by the Foundation of Human Understanding. As you listen with an open mind, you may discover the key to the peace of mind and joy for which you have been searching all of your life. We now join author, lecturer, and talk show host, Roy Masters. And how many people, is there any people here in the room who have been caught up with me in any way? Could you admit it? Would you admit it? Could you admit it? You, you do? How many? It's not my intention, you understand. It's you nice see? when you finally see it. It's, it's nice when you find it is so, isn't it? And perhaps we should talk about that this evening. I mean, I'm open to almost any question, but I felt like it was uh, would be sort of like a cleansing to talk about that and also as a preventative medicine for those of you n new people who should know what my what my my what my heart is and you know strangely the, the the danger is even though you hear me you new people here for the first time even though you actually under hear me and think you understand me you're still vulnerable. See? Uh, you may come back three years from now and you do all those things, start your own business, get out of the big city, you know, whatever it is that I say. And I said, well, remember that Thursday evening? Yeah, I did. I thought I understood it. You still did it anyway. I meant to go in the um, office if there is somebody can go in my office and get that little, there's a, there's a clipping of the newspaper which says something about 10% of all American people uh, are under, in a hypnotic state. Just a little clipping on my desk, Sid. And uh, the two psychiatrists have been saying that. Probably they're, you know, amongst the 10%. <laughs> you know, and... Um, my uh, young man who sent me the clipping called those two scientists up and talked to them. He says, you couldn't believe it. He said, these guys are like, they're like, they're like um, fence posts. I couldn't talk to them. I was talking to them about what you were saying and they couldn't understand what I was saying. I wanted, I thought I had finally met a soulmate, someone who understood what I've been saying all these years. Now, if you want to know the truth, the actual figures for the hypnotic state that people live in is more than 10 percent which happens to be what is what is uh, 25 million is that right how many how many is 10 percent two yeah no in, in our whole country uh, 250 million so how much is 10 percent of that is 25 million that's right maybe if I get get my glasses on my intelligence will come back um, more than 10 million, there it is, well, ten, that was more accurate. More than 10 millions of Americans are so easily hypnotized, they're actually walking around in a cr kind of trance which can cause serious problems, warn two respected psychiatrists who are probably living under a hypnotic state because they, 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 they got a piece of paper on the wall that says they're intelligent. The psychiatrists describe these people as though get hungry at the mere sight of someone eating, feel itchy if someone scratches, Listen to this. Reach for a cigarette when someone lights up. Constantly buys impulse items from fast-talking salesmen. At least 5% of U.S. population ex extraordinarily hypnotizable, said Dr. Emery Brittner, director of the Institute of Group Dynamics in Roslyn, New York, who bases his estimates on research over a 20-year career in psychiatry. A sizable segment is so easily hypnotized they are in a constant state of exaggerated suggestibility even when awake, and going about their normal daily routine, he warned. They can be easily persuaded to do things afterwards they have no idea why they did them. More than 10 million Americans are stuck in this trance-like state. Do so because of the way they've learned to handle life's problems. And there's the, but there's a way to wake them up, he said. Take a look at your actions, admit that you fall into this category. You must learn to say no, and don't just buy a car because the salesman tells you Check prices and performance and mileage and study what other dealers offer you before buying. And if you have a decision to make, look at the facts and ask the questions and then th start thinking to yourself and you'll soon snap out of your trance-like state for good. And they'll read, yeah, they'll read that. First of all, they don't know that they're in a trance-like state. And if they're told they're one of them, they'll do everything that this man said 
in a trance-like state. <laughs> so you see what the problem. So I, um, I astounded people when I was in the army, as a, when a young man, I could do all kinds of magic tricks. I'm pretty good at uh, sleight of hand and stuff. Still am. Um, I used to be the the platoon entertainer. I had all of the I had all of the soldiers cleaning my boots and blankoing my webbing, cleaning my rifle. The sergeant was completely ignored. He was very jealous. <laughs> and uh, one night, I have to tell you a little, just a little anecdote story, that we were on fire duty called fire picket, and I hypnotized the two officers on duty, <laughs> and nobody did any fire duty. <laughs> but they wrote down the next day that it was like nothing happened as far as they was concerned. Everybody did fire duty, but I had a good night's sleep, and so did they. <laughs> but they thought they were awake all night. <laughs> and there are times when I got so good at what I was doing that, I'm, you know, young men, I go to a dance and I'm sitting there, we're talking about such things as I'm talking to you, but not in such a sophisticated manner. And I would say to the young man, I said, look, you know, uh, I can hypnotize you in your right now without you in your waking state. And I knew who I knew who to pick out. I said, "You see that glass of beer you're holding in your hand?" I said, "Yes." I said, "You can't pick it up." And, and I'm just talking to you know I'm just talking to a guy at a bar, right? It's like a, in, the, in a dance place, and he looks at that and he can't pick it up. This man, I. I never saw him before in my life. I just asserted uh, a fact in an overwhelming, powerful way, looked him straight in the eye, suddenly became his authority, and he reacted in, the, in that sort of childlike, you know, um, to that suggestion. And it was like, as far as everybody concerned, watching and being aware of what I was doing, it was like some kind of Svengali with some kind of power. What all I was doing is um, um, uh, um, demonstrating an influence which didn't take much to, to um, bring about, didn't take much energy to bring that about, which pervades all of society, every one of us to varying degrees, every one of us, no exceptions. Even the President of the United States, subject to various pressures and influences, to which we respond and act, and we act out those responses. And we never draw a same breath as long as we live. The, the person in that state does not know that they're in, they're, or their consciousness is altered. They do not know it. And what is even more frightening is that you cannot show them that they're under any, any influence. No, you, they're in den, immediately in denial. There's something so frightening about that, 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 that anyone could be subject to another person's will that we're in denial about. We, def we protect it. We protect it, meaning we protect another person's will in us, actually. We can't wake up. And so not even the person who has put them under the influence is able to make them aware that they're under the influence. So I could say to that person, but look, you're doing this because I've influenced you. I'm like a Svengali, I've just influenced you, and the reason why you've done all these things is because I made you do them. Do you see that? Now, I want you to believe that. And you know, you can make them believe that. You can actually say, well, for a while they won't believe it, and they say, oh, come on now. I said, look, you've got to believe it, because I said so. I'm telling you, that's the truth. Really? Oh, now that's the truth. But they don't see it. They don't see it. They. The, the part of their brain is separated from the other part of their brain. Well, it's, it's not two brains that's involved. One is a spiritual brain, which isn't a brain at all. It's like, um, it is a replica of our, it's like we have two sets of eyes. We have a set, a, a, a set of, it's like a body within a body. It's like a person within a person. And the person within a person is spiritual. So, and so that, if you can become just objective, then you can speak to both of you. 
So the, the part of you can hear because you have ears to hear and you have a brain to interpret the noise to what it means, while the other part can understand what he hears. See? So one, well, while, while you can remember uh, uh, something and act from that memory without permission of the consciousness, see? If the consciousness was there and could, uh, could then, was free to act on that information, to choose to believe it, to reject what it's accepted. For instance, you may have believed something and you remember it and you thought it was so. But then, then you stood back and you said, no, that doesn't make sense, and you can reject it. But you have to have two parts, one acting on the other for that to happen. One to negate, one to see the truth about the other. Um, Jesus was asked by a man because he wanted to believe in him, and he said, Lord, I believe, but help my thou my unbelief. See, because what he was saying, there's two parts. You see, one part believed him and one part didn't, see? And, and he, sent, he saw that, and he wanted to be made whole so the two parts could believe. But the trouble is, you see, uh, the, the, there's a part of us that shut down, and it's, it's part of us that's in denial of God, because once we've been influenced, there's a certain shame or guilt of allowing ourselves to be violated, and, in, and, and the, because this, it's called sin, when we're violated, we've somehow failed that consciousness has been a party to it, to some degree. And that consciousness which has been a party to what, how we've been affected and acted through uh, is guilty, and, and how it deals with guilt is, as pride usually does, it shuts down the, the re that which could show how wrong it is, and so we're in denial. And so therefore this brain of ours is, is left open, like the circuits are open into the world, and we are influenced by the world around us, see? One person come along and influence us, and then, and we can be their friend, and then, and then another person come along, and pretty soon we're not that person's friend, we're that person's enemy, and this person's friend. You can see that happening in the Persian Gulf. You know, the Iran was suddenly was take the side of, of uh, Saddam Hussein. They've been fighting with Saddam Hussein was their worst enemy for eight years, but they hate America more. So the tendency is to side with Saddam Hussein. You see, the influence is, the, you know, it's a sickness and there's no, there's no consciousness there of the, of, of the insanity of what's going on, that, that, uh, of, of, that we're getting into, tr in, into bed with somebody that's going to kill you, but, and, but never mind, you hate this person more and you need support, you need support for that hate. You see, you, you're driven differently. And so, um, so this is very important point, and I don't want to spend the whole evening, I, I, there's a tendency for me now, since I'm on a roll a little bit, to sort of talk all evening and not give you people a chance to, you know, to voice some, some uh, objections or some, ask for some clarification or identify with what I'm saying. Yes, Every it is. Every day, you know, you go out and you get to face this mean world. It's mean. And it's just not simple to face it. You know, you want to speak up. And well, let me ask you, is it, is it, the way I show you, is it simpler to simply not hate the world and face it, or is it easier to hate the world and not face it? I mean, you've already tried hating the world and not facing it, and licking what you can't, you know, joining what you can't lick. You've, you found that easy or found that hard? That's what you're crying, isn't it? About is it because I, that's I the? I find it. I find it hard not to just just hate. You know. Because Say that again. I, I have a lot of hate in me, and I don't want it. Don't you see that? How do I get him out? Well, I try to meditate. I listen to you. And I know that I put you on a pedestal, and I know that's wrong. I see. That's the reason why. I'm, look, I appreciate your, your honesty. You, do you see that you are what I've been talking about this evening? Yes. And that instead of being caught up with, uh, if I may use the, the term, yourself, your God self, your Christ self, instead of standing back and becoming identified, you know, enveloped in His Spirit, which is a very mystical thing. It's 
There's no, I don't think I could write what that means down on paper. I, I can, the best I can do is sort of give it some kind of high sounding name. But I tell you that if, you heart, if your heart, if your soul is pure, now when I'm saying it's pure in the, in the sense that you really want to find the purpose for which you were created, after, you've heard me say this before, and in that to serve it to be the vehicle of what you were created for, and not to give up, the, give up the sense of I, I am. To give up the sense of the, the, the selfish preservation of your, of your ego, your own self, selfish existence. When you're ready to do that, only then are you ready to experience that other side, that, that other half of you that comes into play, which is called enlightenment, fulfillment, understanding, love. Only, the, only then are those forces released in you to, to neutralize the horrible effects of the world around you. You see, because you stand between two worlds and, and the I-ness, and if you know what I mean by the I-ness, the me, the me, 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 the selfish me, that, yes, that hungry, selfish, greedy, self-seeking, self-fulfilling ego. The I separated from the I am, as if it was an I am itself, you know what I mean? See, that's what, what that separation, the I separated from the I am, which is a, uni un a union with a God, trying to be its own God, above everything, beneath nothing, becomes subject to everything. It becomes vulnerable to the, all of the suggestions and all, the, all of the, um, the influences of life. And slowly but surely, your, our mind gets opened up and you get taken over and you, you get eaten away. Hypnotized. You're hypnotized and confused. You become confused. You know where you're coming or going. You think you're doing right and it's wrong. And, and, and it will always be that way until you have that extra edge, that consciousness which is, well, a young man was talking to me this evening, and I have to, he's, he's the cameraman, as a matter of fact, and I have to remain, can, may I talk about your experience? You want to talk about your experience on the commode? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, would you step forward, because the camera's on me anyway, so we don't need you anyway. <laughs> would, you, would you step forward and explain, come into the limelight and tell me what happened on that commode that day? Yeah. Yeah. Can you just talk to me? Yeah. Um, well, I was telling Mr. Masters that um, about, must have been when I was about 15 years old, and I was sitting on the uh, commode. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds kind of gross, right? Some of the greatest um, ideas happen to you. Uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> And uh, I was going through the, uh, the usual urban problems that a lot of uh, young people go through when you live in the inner city. Um, I had a, a dad who was an alcoholic and home was out of, uh, out of control. And I was kind of in the streets. I had uh, been involved, you know, with drinking and cigarettes, smoking and all this kind of stuff. So there was another part of me that was searching, you know, for something to get away from these problems. And this particular day when I was <laughs> sitting on the commode, I, uh, I started staring at my hands, and uh, I would I would start repeating to myself, uh, uh, "Well, these are my hands, and and this is my body, but but my body's not me." And I just I don't know what made me start saying that, but all of a sudden um, there was some distance that was placed in between um, my body and and my inner person, and uh, it shocked me. I mean, I was it made me afraid. I didn't know what it was. And so I guess I, I went back into, you know, the flesh-based self. But, it frightened uh, him, see. Yeah, it frightened me. And uh, s several years later, um, in my middle 30s, I guess it was, uh, I started listening to Mr. Masters on the, on the radio, and uh, I began to hear him talk about the same uh, type of experience. And um, in fact, that's what reminded me that that happened to me at age. You in other words, I reminded you of a commode. That's <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Every time he sees me, he sees a commode. Right. 
<laughs> and uh, well, that was the basic experience. Thank I mean, you. There's a lot of stuff tied to that, but that's see, his life changed. Once yeah. he got that objective state back, where one part could act on the other and neutralize any negative influence by the mere observation of it, so that one could disagree with the other because there was a, a presence of disagreement or agreement, where everything which is heard, if agreeable, is not necessarily it it trans. It transforms the, what you, for instance, if you hear for something for this evening from me, and you are, are transported into the commode, I mean the objective <laughs> state. <laughs> if, it, if you're just transported into that objective state, then it will happen that whatever you hear from me, or anyone else, if, if it is true, that you perceive it to be true, you could act on it without it being a robotic thing. It could still be your own experience. It could still be that, that you agree with what you've heard because it's awakened you to a, a parallel knowledge of what it's all about. And having heard it and, and, and heard the truth of it uh, and appreciating the truth, having lost sight of it perhaps, or hearing it better, more clarified, from another human being's uh, time-space continuum, see? His reference in his place in time and space. Um, agreeing with it, acting on it, or disagreeing and discarding it, you remain a whole person. You would, you would not be acting out of that person's suggestion, but you would still be acting out of your own appreciation of what he's made you realize. And it's perfectly original in that form. See the difference? But the trouble is when you people listen to me and they start to realize getting becoming objective and they start to see they start to see that their influence is in their life, they also start to see me as an influence in that life, and they start to see that even though they're listening to me, they start to see their body acting and reacting to me, even though they're objective, even though they've got to this objective state, and they, but they start to see me as one of those people that's doing that to them. And they miss that very delicate moment, see? And they start rebelling or resenting me because I am no different from everyone that I'm talking about. Therefore, they start to judge me about that. Who, has anybody ever done that? Oh, you have, have you? Oh, good. Well, I'm glad you see it. Yes, sir. Um, I think this like, has something to do with what you're talking about. One day, um, you were talking over the, you know, the uh, radio station, and uh, you had said that uh, if I have helped you, then help me. You know, you're talking about, you know, giving donation, and and that made so much sense, and it, it like rung a bell to me. I said, yeah, he has helped me. You know, so why shouldn't I give? You know, because I would never give a donation. And I started giving five dollars, and then as I started making more money, I started giving more money, but. Is that the type of thing that you're talking well, about? Well, the question is, you have to ascertain whether the good idea that it was... No, it was like a, 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 a ring, a bell, like... Did you agree? But the point is, did yeah, you agree yes. with it? Have it you may, not felt guilt? Did, you know, did you feel good for giving? No. Good. Because just, if you felt good for giving... It just made sense. It just made sense. Just because it makes sense. Yeah, it just made sense. And the sense of it moves you. The sense is the goodness of it. True. And it's the truth yeah, it just of it. made sense. The truth moves through you. And it doesn't, and it, and it moves through you uh, in the absence of any emotionalism that might uh, impede it and make it revert and make you act because you reacted, or because it makes you act because you're suggestible. It is very important that you d learn or discover or recognize the distinction between your suggestibility, the hearing and being suggestible, because we are all suggestible, because when we don't have this other mind. When, when we are children, we are so traumatized as to, as to lose this other side of ourselves for a while. I, I, for the what a better way of saying it, because I could say it more accurately than that, but it would take too long. Exactly. See, if you, if, you were, if you were violated with a person with white tennis shoes, then that's a, con that's a situation which not what dealt with properly. As you grow through, go through older in life, you would react in a predictable way to a person wearing tennis shoes or just a pair of tennis shoes sitting in someone's closet, it would reactivate the behavior. You would not know or not be conscious 
that your behavior is coming out of a pair of tennis shoes. And you know how kids are today. They, have, they get their identity from tennis shoes, believe it or not. It's not so funny. Speaking I thought that was a funny thing, but they, you know, they'll even kill for a pair of tennis shoes because their identity is somehow, and their behavior is somehow locked into the conditioning or reinforcement of a pair of tennis shoes. Excuse me if I take it just a little too far. Yeah. Oh. But, um, well, I was going to give you um, a true example of what I was going yeah, to Yeah, but I wanted to finish off the thought, if you don't mind. Okay, go for it. Because it's, it's an important thought. You've got me going on a, okay. on a roll here. Okay. Um, you know, I'm an overwhelming swine, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you see, but once you become objective, once, you, once the mind comes into existence again, or, or once the mind, the conscious mind, which is sort of fused to the flesh, to the senses, and therefore um, is not able to observe it, its own idiosyncrasies, and is not able to observe its own behavior, but thinks its own behavior, the behavior that it has reacting to tennis shoes is its own behavior. It, does, it doesn't notice the tennis shoes are always the, whatever happens to be uh, tripping him. As he goes through life, it isn't tennis shoes, it's uh, the, the local bar, the local whore. It's, it's somebody's, the tone of somebody's voice. See? It, there's, there's thousands of things in our environment that have a, a predictable effect on us which we're not conscious of. And it keeps us, for instance, a Mexican goes, a Mexican, uh, excuse me putting it this way, I don't know why I'm picked on Mexicans, but, um, you know, every time, whoop, he's a Mexican, right? And every time he sits, every time he passes a burrito place, the Mexican in him is reinforced. He doesn't know eating a burrito. Is, make, is reinforcing everything he is, and he cannot be anything different because of the burrito. <laughs> See? Now, I, am be not being a Mexican, might have my, re I'm an Englishman, but I am re being re reinforced by my bowler hat. That's how I get my identity. And I even get my, uh, I even get who I am from my own voice. I say, <laughs> hello, darling. <laughs> You see, and they get their enforcement by responding, you know, ma making the, the acceptable noises. You go in the ghetto, and they also make those funny noises. Hey, man! <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah, they all talk funny, and they get their reinforcement, and they, they can't get out of it because they don't realize that they're reinforcing each other's identities, and they cannot get out of who they are, and they die in it. And they're reinforcing their behaviors but they're also, in the same time, they're reinforcing the denial of those behaviors. For every reinforcement of a de behavior is a dulling effect on reality. When you reinforce something, when you take a drink, you're reinforcing behavior. But also, you're dulling the, the, the same time while it's reinforcing you, it's hypnotizing you, it's dulling you to the, w what's happening to you. Feelings, See? So, you go through life, and there are the, the, you, you come home from a hard day's work, you put the music on. You, make, you, you get up in the morning, I see my wife. I don't drink tea and I don't drink coffee anymore. I've got rid of all that stuff. I see her. There's the coffee beans going. Every morning. She's sort of stumbling around in the dark. She says, that smell, she can't stop. I said, look, your teeth are dissolving into the coffee. Look at them. You've got, you got two teeth left in the front, <laughs> and you're still dissolving it. I said, don't, <laughs> don't you realize you're reinforcing all of your crazy... Be this cup of coffee is more than a cup of coffee. It's who you are. It's, uh, it's, you know you can't get moving because you have to have your coffee for the day. What does that mean? You've got to get your behavior reinforcement. You see? Because it's like, it's like it's connecting you to your God. It's connecting to you to some influence because... Well, coffee was in the present. When you grew up, you came up from a violent home, and everybody drank coffee, drank black coffee all day long. They smoked and they drank and they black. Well, that that black coffee is in the presence of those experience of that experience. And see, and so that it's where your behavior was being molded, and that black coffee or is what is is needed to revive who you are. Because if you don't have the black coffee. If you didn't, 
if you forbear to, 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 to brew it for yourself and, and, and imbibe the aroma. Oh, like it's, like, it's like a fix, right? <laughs> it's exactly the same thing, except it's legal. It's exactly the same thing. If you don't do that, if you give up, start giving up all those things which are familiar to you, a, t a terrible thing start to happen, you start to wake up. The, con the consciousness which is sort of fused to the flesh, sort of identified with the animal, borrowing in the feeling self, taking security in the feeling self that are awakened by those reinforcements, starts to be released from the flesh, from being glued, fused to the flesh, and you start realizing truth. And that's very painful. Now, you see, until you're ready, until you're ready, this truth, uh, this consciousness through which truth shines like a, like, like a light through a lens, it shines on, the, on, on what you've become and starts to dissolve you and this dissolving is like dying, it's painful. And therefore, to the ego animal self, the earthy animal self, this is a very, uh, it's a threat. It's danger. We feel like we're dying, you see. And I tell you that you must go through that. But the problem is, the problem is, you have these great needs to find heroics, to find meaning and existence. You know that's the driving force. That's why you listen to my program. That's why you visit me here. At the same time, at the same time, the very person who could help you tra become, be get to where you say you want to go, I, what you do is you transform me into, every, like, into the likeness of everything else. I become the substitute coffee, the substitute smell, the look in my eyes, the smile. You involve yourself with me and my teachings and you see, it's, all, it's, a, it's a facsimile. Okay. Question. Uh, for a long time, you know, I was discovering things and, and, and I'm having a problem now with my daughters because here, you know, in the relationship that I've had with my wife and so forth, so I finally, you know, uh, found out how to relate and, you know, how to properly love her. What kind so of trouble are you having with daughters? Is it it's, a, it's a problem of, of how they relate to other men, you know, and, and here uh, how, I don't want to try to control them, but yet I want to guide them. Right. And show them, you know, hear the show them that, hey, don't be hypnotized by the rest of the world because, you know, like I've seen them when they go out but and they can't hear they, you. The world, the worldly hypnosis is stronger than you are. Yeah. Yeah. It See, must be because I, I went to, you because know. Because if you're not, if you're not, if you're of the world like the world is, and before the time of awakening, you are of the world like the world is. And that's what I was. Not only you are you an example of what the world is, so that the world, so you set them up for the world, right? I did. But mm -hmm. then you try to, when you try to influence them, to counter-influence the world, they see your influence, you see, see the effort of it, where the world is so effortless in its influence. You know, it's like a, a man gets caught up with his, uh, a son gets caught up with his g girlfriend, and the mom sees, because she knows what women are like, she s knows what the girl is up to, the boy doesn't. And, and so, but the boy, the girl's got an effortless, you know, access to this boy's mind. Mm, yes. And, but, but mom doesn't have the same influence. Mom's losing her power to this other woman. She doesn't have the same powers. She only had it for her husband, right? She can't use it here. Now she starts to use a little effort. Oh, can't you see what this woman is doing to you? She, the boy sees the influence. Well, but he doesn't see the influence of the girl. And who do you think? It only drives the boy to the girl, right? Yeah. Now, what do you have to have in order to be a counter influence to the influence. It's got to be the influence of no influence. No influence? It's, you see, yeah. because if it's the influence of influence, that's what's wrong with the world. That's what the world is influencing. That's it's what it's I struggle so hard because here as a parent, you know, like I said, I've known, I know I've done a lot of wrong, a lot of wrong because I, uh, I'm a very strong person, you know, I have a lot of <laughs> anger that comes out and so forth. That's not strength. Though. Uh, that's, that's true. I mean, that's the wrong kind of strength. But, and I know that I've you know, tried to guide them in a real, you know, tight-fisted type of way. And now that I realize what I've done, I want to draw back, but yet I want them See, to... See, it's, it's, it's a tough, it's a tough You know, situation. I want to know where can I stand as a parent and say, okay, this is where I draw the line. 
because I'm living in a, in a family with three women and they're very strong-willed, you know, and here I'm battling trying to... Wendy's well, still the alive. The warm... The warm... <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was looking at your body shape. It just did seem to suffer, so... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, that's, you know, that's the thing that I'm struggling with, is where can I draw... Well, look, um, I can only answer you in, in, a, in a, a, a generality, but it's a very powerful one. And that is that uh, I can only point to my own experience. I have one daughter. And um, my daughter has such love for me. And, and uh, uh, she, at one time she thought I was going to die oh, a few years ago. And, and uh, she was all broken up about it. I said, look, Diane, you've got to let me go, right? Now, don't you see that you have a husband now? And he has to finish off the work I, I, I began. And he's a good man. And you have to work out your problems with him. But if you do that, you see, and I see you all broken up and, and wherever I'm going, I'm going to be very disturbed about that. You've got to let it go. So I helped to, to, to let it go. But she was a little bit caught up with her dad. And then there comes this maturing, this experience where she thought she was going to lose me. And, uh, and now she has sort of gone beyond that. But the thing is about, but the point I'm going to try to make here is that my daughter has such perfect love for me that if I was to say to her, to the, the man she was going to marry that she loved, don't marry that man because he's not right for you, she'd drop him like a hot potato because she'd believe me. Because she's always known that I've always saved her from herself and from wrong influences, including mom, mom. Saved her sanity. And I've never failed her. And that I've always had the best interest in her heart and I've always tried to guide her to that and to herself. And so therefore, I. Therefore, there's a, a bond between us that is not hypnotic. S somewhat, because there's this father-child relationship, but that dis dis dissolves. But there still leaves this other. To know that I would not, it, that she could actually trust my perception when she can't trust, when she doesn't know for, for sure herself. Although, for the most part, she doesn't call me about things because she's a very strong-minded person and sees things for herself, which I brought up to be. But on those conditions where there's these influences, I could step in and say something and it would count. But it would count without effort because of that unbroken bond of fidelity. So I've never failed her. No, I mean never failed her. And that's where I have. I have failed them and I know that I don't have the full trust. But then you have a failing self that is yeah. so influenced by the world. Trust. See, and therefore it can't count, counter influence the world. Don't you see that? That's why it's so important for you all to be, if you'll pardon the way I put it, perfect. I mean, per being of perfect accord, being of perfect intent, that's perfect enough. Because children can see your intent. They, if your intent is pure, they can see through your weaknesses. I've known women whose fathers were alcoholics, driven to be alcoholics by their crazy w women, because they just didn't know how, they weren't skilled in dealing with what, you know, the Saddam Hussein in their life. They just were well, decent men, and they just didn't know, they weren't trained in dealing with it. The decency is still in there. And even though the man comes home drunk at night and, and swears and rants and raves, the little girl looks at this and sees that Dad is in trouble and can't help himself. He doesn't know what he's up, he doesn't know how to deal with it. Her perception, her awareness, her love of God, actually, the truth, her own love of God has given her perception. And she sees through it all. She sees that her mother setting up her father for this and has love for her father. That's what saves her. Now the father, even though he's a drunk, see, and now she's getting caught up with something and the father will come up and say, look, daughter, you know, I know I haven't really been a good father, but I wish you wouldn't go out with this guy or do this or do that. She loved that. She, she's not relating to the drunk. She's not relating to the, anything else. She's relating to the purity of his spirit that... It's kind of lost, but see what I'm saying? Even under those conditions, it will work. What I'm saying is, that's what you've got to have. In order to, in order to be, you've got to bring another world. You have to bring another world to bear on this world through you. That's what I'm trying to uh, lead you into in my you know, teaching to bring this other world into, into the world through you, and not me superimpose my world or, on you. I can't give that to you. I can't give you what I've got. 
but and some of you are envious, and some of you are so envious and so egotistical as to be jealous of what I have, or jealous of my kids being my kids. You see what I mean? And then to covet that, and to want a piece of me. And when I don't give you a piece, you know, you would have secret resentments. You can't take it from another human being. Don't you see that? The gentleman back there. Who can judge true or uh, who can judge right or wrong if what you believe is the only truth that you follow? Say, uh, explain that again, would you try? Who, who can judge right and wrong if, if what you believe is the, you know, the only truth that you follow? Uh, yeah. Help, help me with that one. Then. I mean, uh, who can judge what is right or wrong? You know what I'm saying? How can you judge right and wrong? Yeah, who can judge? If who can judge is Saddam Hussein? He said what he said, he do he think he, he believe is uh, right. Yeah. And we see a wrong. Well, a devil, and over there they see us wrong over here. Well, you have to understand that. You, I mean, if there is a right and a wrong, right? Which you are saying that there is a right and a wrong. There is a good and an evil. The the there are two extremes. The wrong thinks he's right, but he's wrong. See? And the wrong thinks the right is wrong. He, th he thinks the evil is the right person. And he thinks the good is the, the wicked person. He doesn't see himself as wicked. But so who sees him? Okay. So what we do, we have, what we have is a war of worlds. We do have a war of worlds where there are wicked people who, who see evil as good and they see good as evil. The, Bible, the scripture talks about that. Now, when you ask me the question, who's to say? Well, I am to say, and Saddam, Saddam Hussein does his thing. He asserts a wrong for a right, and he thinks my right is wrong, and he comes to war with me. Now, I can either join him because he's so strong and he's wrong that I could think I would, that I was wrong and, and give up my right and and join his wrong and think I'm right, like some, <laughs> okay. I mean, like at all, there's a whole bunch of confused, oh, there's 17 million of them over there, right? So, and it happens every day in home, in every household it happens every day. This is Saddam Hussein who confuses the living crap out of everybody. <laughs> but if it's somebody like Egnocentri, you know, this, he just believe what that person believes is the only right way. Well, no, I'm coming to that. You know, if I believe killing is good, that's what I believe. I, uh, you know, I know. Despite what other people think. Well, you know. So who can judge me? Who lives that? by the sword will, will die by the sword, and I'm the one that's going to kill him. <laughs> if you've got the point. In other words, this is where the heroics comes in. This is where, where the wrong people who think they're right, and they have the power and the intelligence to impose their right upon you and try to convert you and confuse you and destroy you and destroy your innocence and make you and make you, you know, part of their system, like Saddam Hussein, as a perfect example. We have Saddam Husseins in, in, in marriage, we have Saddam Husseins in government, we have Saddam Husseins in the church, you have Saddam Husseins with your friends. You see, we have Saddam Husseins everywhere and you have leaders and followers. And on, on two extremes you have Saddam Husseins who are really evil and you have a lot of people sort of, and people who are like good people, like uh, 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 Colin Powell, not Colin Powell, everybody calls him Colin Powell. <laughs> Colin Powell. And then G G General Sportskopf. These two people are just noble souls. I mean, it's, it's all over their face, especially Colin Powell. A very, uh, he'd be, for me, he'd be the first pr black pr president. I'd vote for him any day. I see that he's where he's coming from. His countenance shows it. See? He has a, he shines. And Schwarzkopf is, uh, he also talked about an out-of-body experience. Remember that when he, he says he went, he he said well, a reporter asked him how did he experience danger when he was in the Marines or when he was in the Army. He said I, I hate to tell you this, but it sounds crazy, but it was like an out-of-body experience. I felt like it wasn't happening to me. Understand, we're talking about a man who's becoming objective under stress, so that the spirit moves through him and not him move, not any uh, not not any other uh, other. Uh, element moving through him. He's not responding ego for ego. It's divine ego against not so divine egos. And he's, he's out of the way and something's acting through him and he can't understand how he comes out of it in one piece 
victorious because it was the divine that was acting through him. And I'm saying to you that there are these two forces of the, in the world, to the evil that have a consciousness of sorts that's reverse. They're called sociopaths or psychopaths. They have no conscience. As a matter of fact, if they don't kill you, and if they don't put their cigarette out in your eyeball, see, they had a bad day. <laughs> see? See? They derive their power from terrifying and confusing torture. They derive life from other people's death. And they have a dark power that, that, that guides their lives. And they're points of darkness. They're, and, and they're able to intimidate large numbers of people, even though the large numbers of people are not sociopaths or psychopaths. They are the arms, the extensions of the sociopaths and psychopaths, the evils of the world. And some of them will be destroyed, and some of them are used in armies, and some are used to destroy the innocence of others, and eventually are destroyed themselves. And some of them, well, they change sides, they wake up. You know, I was a Saddam Hussein bodyguard. I just didn't want to do that anymore. I couldn't stand to see that. I saw him for what he was, and I came over to America. I was a Nazi. Uh, I was a Nazi camp commander, and I, can't, I woke up and realized what I was doing. I was an abortionist. I was a doctor. I had 20,000 abortions I did, and I thought I was doing the right, right thing. And then one day my daughter, you know, got run over, and, and I realized the preciousness of life. And suddenly they woke up from the hypnotic trance, and, and I'm trying to get... I, I, was, I was a leader. I, I got people to... I got people to get to, uh, abortions. I was able to persuade them to do the wrong thing if it was the right thing. And now I'm trying to talk to these same people and they can't hear me. You see that there are, in other words, they, there are people who are not sociopaths or psych, but they're caught up for a while in the system and they're used as an instrument of evil and they do wake up. And sometimes people from the good change to the bad, and sometimes the bad change to the good. There's a great gulf of people in between the good and the evil, but there is a good and there is an evil, and then you choose your side, and let's hope you choose right. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> because, I, because who's to say, but you are to yeah. say. So that's yeah. that there, there's not a God, there's not an outside conscience that can judge you, only another man, that's what you're saying, right? Pardon? Um, no, no. No, you have... I'm talking uh, about... Well, I, 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 let me tell you something. I do not know the mystery of it. I will not... cannot explain this mystery. It is a great, great mystery. But there are some people who love what's right. They love... they're looking for the purpose for which they're created. They're looking for the truth, and these people are attracted to the truth, and, and it, it, it's a gift. They, they don't understand... A lot of you people are gifted beyond your wildest imaginations. You do not know. You are not conscious. Well, I say you're conscious, but you're not fully... Uh, you're not fully aware or appreciative of what you have that sets you apart from all the, the, the evil in the world that enables you to see evil as evil. See? Because a lot of people are walking around in a trance. And you can see them walking around in a trance. As you get more and more and more aware and more conscious and as you're more committed to do the right thing and you stand up for what's right and you give up your little, your little habits and your consciousness becomes freer and freer and you see clearer and clearer. As I get, as I get older, I mean, if I could be scared, I'd be scared to death to see what I'm seeing around me in America. It's overwhelming. It's no wonder people want to shut up and go to sleep, and then if you can't lick them, you join them. You stay asleep with all of those who are asleep, and you go through life. Friends of the enemy, dying. But as you become aware, you must have had it since you were a child, and lost it and gained it and lost it, but now have found it more permanently. You have this gift that if you will stay the course, you will find that eternal life. You will find a magic existence beyond any possible description. And you will see, you will see that you will have to go, you may, will have to go to war. You will become, because of your consciousness, you will become so set apart by virtue of this distance you have, people will feel themselves watched. You see? They, are, they suddenly, you're not like them anymore. Something's happened to you, and there's a new spirit operating through you, looking at the, the spirit operating through them. 
warfare, instant warfare. Now the warfare is, can you bring some people over to your side? Can you bear the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune? Can you bear their cruelty and their, their, their twisting of your truth? Can you bear their slander and their lies and their cheating? Huh? Can you bear the insults and the injury without hating them? And can, you, can you develop that strength which that experience is designed to be a, a foil? Can you? Because if you do, strange things begin to happen. Just because of that, the influence of no influence. Remember, they couldn't influence you, but you didn't have to influence back because you didn't have to. You used to have to because you had to out-influence a person. But the secret is to influence, but no influence. And when they find they can't influence you, they, found they, they come face to face in a power greater than both of you. Their God, see, is no match for your God. And they're either they're terrified, frightened. A lot of people are frightened of Roy Masters. See, you know that they are, a lot of people are afraid of me. But I'm not a terrifying person. The only thing that's afraid is the wickedness that's in them. See, that's the only thing that's afraid. Or they, or they see themselves by that, and, 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 and they see what they've never seen before and they begin to appreciate where you're coming from and want to come from the same place. They want to go, you awaken in them, they the rekindle the desire to want to be want what you have, and they bring them over to your side. And this is how the war is fought. Sometimes the war is fought with, with you know, weapons, weapons of real war, which we are seeing now. But still you'll see those who are Saddam Hussein oriented, so that when the evil rises in a different country, they are attracted to it to give it their first loyalty. And they see the enemy as their friend, and their friends as their enemy, their own countrymen. See that? Now the mystery of it, the mystery of who gravitates where, who polarizes to what, the evil is the good, and the good is the, or the good is the good. How that is so is a blessing. You either got it or you ain't. It's marked in you from birth. You can't give it to yourself. It lays there dormant. Through all your suffering is what stirs you to seek it. See? Or not seek it. See? The guilt piles up, and, and it piles up in such a way is that you don't want to live your life as, with this guilt that you want to find the truth to take, your way, take away that tr guilt. You want to find something to take away the guilt. But which something takes away the guilt has to do with the inclination of your soul. Do you take refuge in the enemy? <laughs> or, or seek the refuge from the enemy, but you know not where it is. And that yearning, that hungering and thirsting after righteousness is what Jesus was talking about. Seek and you shall find. Yearn and you shall find. Yes, well, this lady here. Um, I went, a long time ago, you told me I called you, I was a little younger, and you said, that's okay, you know, you said basically I'll be your dad then. Because, and you told me a to stop, surrogate. Right, you told me to stop doing some things. So, I mean, is it okay to come to you and ask you as if I was going to, because I don't have my father, and, and right. if he was here, he probably wouldn't know how to answer it anyway. But to ask you if I'm doing it right, like meditation, am I being objective? I, can't, I, I don't know if I'm doing it right. But I'm not able to answer those questions. You will have to realize those things for yourself. I've given you a very good talk this evening, I thought, a fairly decent talk this evening on a very important subject and that you must discern all things for yourself. And I tell you this, if you're doing it wrong, you'll, you'll see, you'll see that it's wrong. Because if you, if you're, if you, if it's in your heart to want to know the truth, eventually, the, anything that is acting through you, anything you're doing which is not in concert with reality, that's not in sync with reality, makes you self-conscious of it sooner or later. I tell you this, I've told my wife this evening, I said, we were talking about this over dinner, and I said, now, Anne, don't you see, I'm talking to this gentleman about how the likes of us, because we live in this world of awareness, and we can see the timing, we can see whether a person is faking or not faking, because he may do the right thing, but he may do it two seconds too soon or two seconds too late, 
or not at all when he should have done it. And if a person of grace knows and recognizes another person of grace. We both know where we're coming. We, it's, there's, 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 you might say there's a computer chip in our brain that recognizes a computer chip that, that knows what a computer chip in another phrase is supposed to do, but it, although we don't lay it on you and say you're supposed to do it. This is the extra you're supposed to do, but it's the extra they offer, that the extra will we would offer, and we see the graciousness. All we see it is pretense to get our confidence. See the difference? So, I can't tell you. You will f you, anything that is not perfectly true, anything you're not doing right, wait. It will be, you'll be conscious of it. Don't be in a hurry. You've got your whole life ahead of you. And as long as you're sincere, listen, as long as you're seeking sincerely, nothing will happen to you. You'll have the life you need. See? Wisdom is the length of your days. Don't worry, nothing's going to happen to you. I know you're afraid of dying and all, something might happen to you before you find the truth. And is that right? All that sort of stuff goes on in your little brain, doesn't it? Something like that. I guess because I'm learning how to, uh, well, I'm trying to meditate and... Don't try too hard. Right, and I think that's where my problem is. And, you see, and as you, I'm see you said it yourself. Right, and I think as I'm driving and I'm driving in my car, you know, I, I also try to, like, sometimes I'll stop and I'll try to just feel myself being still and then... And then sometimes, I'm, and all of a sudden, I caught up in this big daydream, and I'm like, whoa, uh -huh. what happened? But you see, the problem is trying too hard. Did I ever ask you to try? Yeah, that's, your problem is trying. Trying always involves ego. Let go, let God. The less you try, the, the more quiet, the more relaxed you are, the less you have your own will and effort in anything, the more things will be as they ought to be perfectly natural. See, that's what you. That's what. That's the lesson you're going to learn. Let go. Let go. Let go. Don't worry. It'll be all right. Don't try to know. You'll know. So don't get involved. Like a lot of times, just just, that's, just that's, watch that's everything. That's your whole. That's, that's your whole on. job. This is your. This is your assignment. Where's that music? <laughs> <laughs> See, burn the tape when you finish with it. Yeah. Right. This is your assignment. Your assignment is. Just wa watch the degree to which your ego is involved with struggle and resentment. And just, every time you see it, relax. Step back. You see yourself worrying? Know that you can never solve anything by worry. Step back. Step back and let the, the light, your consciousness act like a lens for the light. So the light becomes a very strong, cogent force. See? I hope that's uh, understood. And the, uh, the self, actually, this ego self disappears and the new self emerges. So that's called being born again, yeah.